All right. So uh, this is... Uh, if you recognize the voices, <laughs> Nigel, Luke. This is us. This is us. As they say, uh, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Because well. uh, you're stuck with us now. Yep. That's... Uh, well, actually, we'll get to that it, a bit it, later. It is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, first things first. Uh, thanks so much to everyone who sent in questions for this Q&A. Uh, we really weren't sure how this was going to go. Um, we were waiting. Wild gamble. We were waiting... <laughs> Those of you that have been with us since the beginning, we, we were waiting for the proper setup, first of all, and then for the content to kind of change. So now we've got the, we've got the setup here. Uh, we've got some content that I think everyone's going to be excited about going forward that's going to actually make sense for us to be on camera now. We yeah. didn't really like the idea of just reading the news with a camera in our faces. So Yeah, trying to get uh, creative. We'll get to a couple of announcements, I think, later. Um, but yeah, uh, one other thing. Uh, sorry if you hear like crazy rumbling and like sonic booms overhead. There's an air show um, going on about a hundred feet above our head right now. Yeah, so. the, the, the CNE, they're, right. they're doing the, the, the tests with the jets. So you may or may not hear that. We're hoping that you don't, but yeah, it's uh, not a war zone, but it does sound like one. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, we've kind of organized the questions that you guys sent us into three main categories, kind of general slash personal questions about the channel, uh, true crime questions, just about true crime in general or cases. And then we kind of had like process questions, like some of you guys wanted to know, like how we do what we do, where we find resources and all that sort of stuff. Apologies if we don't get to your exact question. A lot of, uh, a lot of the questions kind of fell a lot of you asked like similar stuff. So we kind of compiled those into our own phrasing. Um, but yeah, we tried to get as many as we, as we could and we'll That's do right. more of these in the future. If, if, uh, if it's something you guys think is valuable and you, and you, and you like, so yeah, I guess without uh, further ado, um, a few, a few rapid fire questions to start. Um, are we Canadian? Yes, we are. We are Canadian. Yes. I think we've mentioned that to a bunch of people in the past. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're Canadian. We're Canadian both. Well, I'm, Born and raised in Toronto. Which leads us to our second question. I do not. I mean, somebody asked if I have a New York accent. I, <laughs> there are multiple New York accents. I'm not from New York. Uh, so, no, I mean, no. No, I don't. Um, how many people are involved in making the channel? Uh, it's the two of us and then our video editor, Camillo. That's basically it. Aiden does some, uh, oh, yeah, did some, did some initial help on YouTube with the media buys, uh, helping yeah. help growing the channel. So that's it. Uh, somebody asked if we're aliens. We're not aliens. I, I, I hope not. Hope not. That's yeah. news to me right. if, 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 if we are. Uh, and then the last uh, sort of silly question, Coca-Cola or Pepsi, Big Mac or Whopper? It's controversial stuff right here. Hard-hitting uh, hard hard hitting questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, we, we have Pepsi at my household, basically. I like them both. We have Pepsi at my house. I, I'm a, I've always been a Coca-Cola man myself, uh, if I had to choose. Um, as for the Big Mac Whopper question, uh, well, I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, I'm in your neighborhood now, but in my neighborhood, there's around 800 McDonald's and one Burger King. So I was actually going to say the same thing. Just well, growing up, there were just like right. not as many Burger Kings for whatever reason as right. McDonald's, and so I, Big Mac just sort of wins by default. I'm by not default. saying I'm not saying Burger King has an inferior product. No, no they're both good. They're both I'm just good. saying I, yeah. I have enjoyed it less, and thus, uh, you know, not really a fair competition. Right. Anyway, uh, into the real questions, I guess. How did you guys get interested in true crime? Similar stories. I mean, obviously, we didn't. I didn't meet Nigel until around five, six years ago. But watching Unsolved Mysteries, watching America's Most Wanted, and for anybody else that had uh, A and E back in the, I guess, nineties, back in the nineties, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the true crime series on A and E was really good. It oftentimes involved the mafia, um, but and and like really old, like from the forties and fifties, Hollywood type murders and crimes. So that's kind of what got me into into true crime. Yeah, similar stuff. I mean, when I was probably about uh, eight or nine, there was a, like a local channel here that used to play Unsolved Mysteries all the time. And by that point, most of them were reruns or like updates and stuff like that. But I mean, yeah, I just kind of fell in love with that show. And I've always kind of been interested in that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, but that was, I think Unsolved Mysteries was really the first show that really kind of <laughs> brought me into that whole genre. How did you guys meet? And what made you want to start the channel? So uh, this is a big one. Actually. It's a big one. It's a big <laughs> one. Is, uh... we, we kind of have to uh, be a little careful with what we say here. But if you want to talk about some of the old, the old stuff that we were doing, and yeah, so basically uh, a few years ago uh, in 2016, uh, 
I essentially got hired to work for Luke's company, uh, doing like content and stuff like that. And we had a few different things we were working on, but basically what happened was a few years into that, um, and this will explain hopefully to a lot of you out there who are like, why are you always talking about how much you hate YouTube? Why are you always talking about how triggered you are by YouTube? Um, well, basically we got mass copyright flagged on all of our stuff, like kind of an overnight, we lost all of all of the stuff that we've been working on for uh, the better part of like two, three years of that. Well, there's yeah. air show. Air there show. Yeah. yeah. If we didn't hear it before, yeah. Sorry, I paused there because yeah, crazy jet sounds. Yeah. But yeah, we lost everything that we'd been working on overnight without warning. Without warning, there was no real way to appeal it, um, and it was Warner Brothers that did it. Uh, no way to reach out to them, basically. And uh, yeah, we kind of. They we, yeah, they basically flagged like I think sixteen or seventeen of our old videos from in some cases two and three years prior, overnight. It's, so it's I mean they don't even give they didn't give us a chance to, let alone appeal even take it down. It was just we were done. And this was all we won't get into the exact nature of the content, but it was right. parody stuff, right. well within the lines of fair use. And uh, the, pro the the unfortunate thing as a creator is that like you don't necessarily the odds are not stacked in your favor. Let's just let's just put it that way. Um, you know, we've and we've been transparent with you guys before about the problems that we've had in the past with it. It's just really, really tough. We're we're very careful, and we were we were careful. There were some learning some learning experiences that we had to deal with, but we did make some mistakes. Um, and there might have been a couple of legitimate strikes against us. This is like three, four years ago. But with Crime Zone, we've been extremely clean, extremely careful, and even doing that, there's there have been a couple times where Glenn Wall for one and. I guess Warner also hit us once as well. Yeah, Warner hit us once. To, we this, never... day, to this day, we, we have no idea. We, we didn't use any of their footage, but they, they somehow gave us a strike two years ago. We think it was probably a troll because there's there's people that will just IP troll people right. and they'll use <clears> like a do not reply email and basically there's there's nothing you can do about it because uh, you're kind of left... Uh, Left to the wolves. <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're we're ranting a little bit a little bit about this, yeah. but but basically what we we realized that we we're both into true crime, um, and that it seemed crazy enough. It seemed safe. It seemed like it was a safe sort of genre to head into on on YouTube without having to worry about the copyright claims. There's certain words you can't use. Obviously, you can't show actual crimes. You can't show actual footage of 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 dead people or murdered people. But uh, we figured there was there was a way around that, and it's been good so far. Yeah, we've been talking about it tons in the office, and we yeah. just kind of said, like, hey, we should maybe just start a new channel based around this. And yeah. uh, we did, and weirdly, it took off. It did. Um, and uh, Slowly. Yeah, yeah, it was, a, it it was, was a, definitely a grind. Yeah, the uh, again, we, we, we were kind of surprised with... Um, the first video that really took off was our 2020 DNA, uh, Cases Solved by DNA Evidence. Oh, yeah, 2020. yeah, yeah. And Nigel and I were looking at, like, I think Nigel actually called me um, this would have been what January of yeah. 2021, probably over the Christmas holidays. It's like, are we being attacked by bots? Like, what's going on? The views were just skyrocketing, and apparently the algorithm hit in our favor for once, <laughs> and uh, that's where most of you became subs. So yeah, yeah. And the the rest they say is is history. Do you guys have any formal education in journalism? Have you done any voiceover work? That's a hard no for me. <laughs> uh, um, no voiceover work. Right. Um, I wouldn't say that I have a formal background in journalism. Like I went to school for media and uh, we did take like journalism classes. I specialized in public relations, weirdly enough. I have not done much with it since, but there are things that I definitely carried over from that education into this, like just undeniably. But no, I would never like, I would never say I had like, I would never call myself a journalist. If right. that's, if that yeah. makes any sense. What case has stayed with you the longest or has been the hardest on you mentally? I think anything to do with like kids is just really hard. It's just, we don't tend to cover stories like that for that reason. Um, but in terms of a specific case, um, it's funny. I don't want to bleed too much into the next one because we're going to answer specific unsolved mysteries questions. Uh, but there was this one, um, the murder of Larry Dickens um, by Edward Harold Bell on, there's an episode about it on unsolved mysteries. And uh, weirdly enough, it's also one of, uh, I found this out years later, um, that it was one of Matthew McConaughey's first roles ever on screen. And he actually plays Larry Dickens, who was who was the murder victim in this case. But basically like Edward Harold Bell, he'd already, I think murdered people at this point, but he was like walking around this neighborhood, like flashing people, like 
and uh, I think he exposed himself to a bunch of kids, and then he tried to steal a truck from Larry Dickens' mom, and he confronted him, and then Larry Dickens ended up being shot in the driveway, and uh, Ed, Ed Harold Bell drove off with that truck, and it was only... I think it was that murder that ended him getting ended up getting him caught for a number of other murders. That one just scared the sh out of me as a kid. Um, and that's always stayed with me for some reason. Right. Yeah, yeah. And for for me, it was an episode of Unsolved Mysteries that aired in I believe 1990. Um, but it was a Teresita Bassa case, and she was a nurse in Chicago that she was murdered um, by an orderly. And how they found out that the orderly was the the killer was apparently through the ghost of Teresita Bassa relaying on sort of what happened and who the perpetrator was to one of her friends, one of her co-workers. So I mean, I'm not going to give away too much of it. We've never covered this story because it's it was also one of the first Unsolved Mysteries cases, if, if not the only one, where the murder was already solved. And the reason why Unsolved Mysteries covered it was because of the ghostly aspect of it, uh, the supernatural aspect. But as a kid watching it, it was, you know, a grisly murder plus ghost equals terrified kid. So <laughs> that's pretty much why that one sticks to me. What's your favorite slash most haunting episode of Unsolved Mysteries? I'll give another one since we kind of already touched on it before, but uh, we actually covered this one too in a video. It was uh, Dorothy <clears throat> Donovan. It was a case from uh, June of 1991. Basically, her son, Charles Holden, was coming back from work in uh, Harrington, Delaware one night, and he stops off to basically, I think, get some food and stuff like that at a local kind of gas station, uh, fast food place. Um, and he, he stops along the way and he's approached by a guy at the side of his pickup truck window. And the guy asks him for a ride and he's, he's on his way home. He doesn't really want to deal with it. He says like, I'm sorry, I can't help you, whatever. The guy's super insistent, says that his uh, sister, I believe, has just had a baby. She, he just needs to get to the hospital down the road. So finally, Charles like relents and is like, all right, I, I can take you part of the way. And so he gets in the truck, they're driving down the road and, uh, Basically, the guy starts to act like progressively more and more weird. And then when Charles gets him to the place where he's supposed to get out, the guy refuses and things quickly get very disturbing. Like they get into an altercation. Charles ends up having to flee the vehicle, but he, he manages to grab the keys. The guy chases him with a screwdriver and tries to attack him. He ends up getting he ends up cornering Charles. Um, basically Charles manages to talk him down, says, okay, like, let's go back to the pickup truck, relax, I'll drive you. They start walking over and before the guy can get inside, Charles runs around, gets in the pickup and manages to take off, leaving the guy, you know, at the side of the road. And he thinks that everything's cool, like everything's safe. And he's not going to take any chances though. So he drives around a little while, but when he gets back to his house, where he lives on this like large sort of rural property. He lives in one place and then his mother's house is on the same property nearby. Who should he see but the same dude walking out? And so the guy's freaked out. He like leaves the scene and then comes back, calls police and stuff like that. Turns out that the guy has murdered Charles's mom and it's just like a complete freak accident after like the guy didn't know where he lived. He was a complete stranger. But just like it's kind of one of those what are the chances type things. Super crazy. And it took them a long time to actually solve the case. Um, we've done a whole video on it. So if you want to learn more details, check it out. But yeah, that's definitely, if not the most haunting Unsolved Mysteries yep. episode I've ever seen. It definitely top 10 for, for sure. sure. Definitely. What unsolved case would you like to see solved? Um, for me, uh, definitely there's two cases that are it's theorized that they're linked. Um, and a lot of you guys uh, have probably seen these two that we covered, uh, I think it was last year or the year before. Uh, there was one, the murder of uh, Oki Al Kite, and two, uh, the murder of a uh, real estate agent, Mike Emmert. But these are both like really brutal, chilling murders. They happened within three years of each other in the early 2000s. Um, happened in, in different states, I believe. One happened in Colorado, the other happened in Washington. But uh, basically, in both cases, there was this like weird stranger. Um, I think in in the Oki Al Kite case, it was uh, this guy named Robert Cooper. And uh, in the Mike Emmert case, it was this guy named Steven. But they knew so little about it. Th th these were like the prime suspects in the case, but they couldn't find any information about right. these people. But the murders were absolutely brutal, absolutely chilling. 
and almost seemed like they'd been done like a prof by a professional because like this person had thought of almost everything left very little details behind and the details that were found were like super chilling so i would like to know j just just purely like what the hell happened were these cases related it, definitely two of the most chilling murder cases we've ever covered on the channel before if you haven't seen those definitely check those out and uh i'd love to hear your theories about that because that's uh that's truly truly insane are there any cases you think the wrong person was convicted I mean, yeah, there's definitely a lot of cases. We actually kind of had the same answers for this we um, in terms two of, of the same, both of the same answers, really. So, yeah. yeah, the main one is, and I'm sure a lot of you guys probably back in the day, if you're true crime fans, uh, listen to the podcast Serial. It's actually been a long time ago now. It's almost 10 years, I think, years since Serial came out. It was like 2014, I think it was. But yeah, the uh, Heyman Lee case from 1999 out of Baltimore, out of Baltimore Maryland. Um, yeah, her, her boyfriend at the time, Adnan Syed, was convicted of the murder. Ever since I've listened to Serial, I didn't think, at the very least, I came away from Serial thinking that Adnan shouldn't have been sent to prison with that case. But then afterwards, uh, listening to, there, there's a, a woman named Rabia Chowdhury, who is the friend or, or the sister of his friend. And she did her own podcast on it and introduces like a lot more information that wasn't included in Serial. And then ever since then, I was like, okay, like I absolutely don't think he did it. Um, just recently, I, that whole case finally came to light and he was let out of prison, but I think there's still some stuff that needs to be ironed out legally with all of that. Well, even when, when you and I first started talking about this case, he was still in prison and it didn't look like he was ever going to get out actually. No, a hundred percent. years ago, so. Because there was, uh, I remember, uh, one of the things, uh, this actually kept me up one night because I, I watched the HBO series on it right. that came out probably two or three years ago now. And at that time, uh, the, he had just gotten the appeal right. and then the appeal got struck down and it, it was just like this endless, like, like any wrongful conviction case, if you've ever watched something about one of those, there's tons of them, uh, docu-series that have been done now, but they're all so frustrating because every time you think like the right thing might finally happen, there's always like two more steps till it finally actually does. And there's, there's um, shenanigans involved sometimes too, where it's, it's, even if there's not 100% guilt, there's a lot of questions. The DA just has to stick with it. And it's like, no, you know what? We believe this is the case 10 years ago and five years ago and two years ago, and we're just going to stick with it no matter how much new evidence comes. Right. And it's, they, they don't ever want to admit they that they want, were wrong. Right. And I get that. I get that. Right. Like, but it's so much, uh, it's so much harder to, to side with them, uh, than it is with like, cause like in a lot of times with the, with the families in this case, they don't want to see the person let out of jail either. But I, I at least totally empathize, sympathize with that because it's like, you were told that this person right. did it. You've had closure for how many years now? And then all of a sudden they're, they're saying that, oh, maybe we got it wrong or so like in the, in the Heyman Lee case, I think the family was very much against Adnan's release. And I, I don't blame them. If you were told by the police, you know, this is the guy that killed your, your family member. Of course, you're not going to want him let out of prison. But the unfortunately, uh, the unfortunate reality is at the end of the day, like they're ultimately the ones that are still left without answers. Right. And then this guy has had what 20 years of his life stolen now. So, I mean, that's definitely one. Right. Um, I mean, not on the same level, but uh, if you guys ever watched the documentary, The Staircase, that covers um, the uh, Kathleen Peterson case and the, the subsequent uh, uh, trial and conviction of her husband, uh, Michael, Michael Peterson, Peterson. Um, I was pretty convinced by that one. Uh, not necessarily that he didn't do it, but that the case was not strong enough to send him to jail. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence. That was a, a odd coincidences. Obviously. That was a really hard one to watch. It's, it's, too. It is a weird one to watch. It is. But again, if you're just basing it off of the evidence that you have in this particular case, would anyone else have been sentenced the way he was? I don't know. And that's one where we had actually both heard of uh, the case because it was an, on an old episode of Forensic Files. Right, that's right. Um, I remember we talked about that a lot yep. when we both first watched that. The, the good Forensic Files, the original. The, the, the original files. one. Yeah, yeah. Not uh, the new ones tried to make improvements, but. We actually had it gave us an idea for a, a, a video series that we may or may not do in the future. Actually, I mean, let us know if you're interested in right. this idea. But we were thinking about doing like a series on like forensic files got it wrong or like basically episodes of old crime shows where it turned out what they told you in the show wasn't really true or correct. It was, it was accurate at the time of filming and then, and then new everything evidence changes. Right. right? right. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, let us know if you're interested in that. Maybe right. we'll we'll do that. 
Favorite strange or dumb criminals? Oh, um, <laughs> this is one where there's like so many to choose N from. Nigel does all of the research for this stuff. <laughs> and it's uh, Camilla, our video editor, helps out as well for a lot of the South American stuff. But um, Nigel goes through thousands of, of different I'm, websites and news. Like it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous how much research he has to do for this stuff. And there's no shortage of these kinds of cases. Right, yeah. Um, for strange, I would definitely say, uh, and it's again, if you've been following the channel for a long time, it's probably a story of seeing uh, the roof man case, uh, Jeffrey Allen Manchester, the guy who lived inside of a Toys R Us, who was like also a, 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 a robber, an armed robber. Uh, that's a wild story. Honestly, I, I can't even do it justice retelling it here. So watch that if you haven't. Um, there's also uh, the, the Ren Xiaofeng story about the guy who uh, robbed a bank to play the lottery out of China. That one actually is one of my personal favorites. Didn't do the, the greatest in terms of view, in terms of views. That's uh, it's one of those things which is weird actually. Like one, sometimes the ones you're the most invested in are the ones that people we're, don't And we're really... not gonna go down the whole list, but some of the stories, some of the episodes that we've done that we feel are, are the most interesting to us, YouTube's algorithm, not so much. Oh so. yeah, no, no, that's that's another part of it. In terms of pure like dumb mm -hmm. criminal thing though, I think my favorite just sort of like karma story uh, of that whole variety was probably the guy, uh, I wrote it down here so I wouldn't forget it. Uh, this guy in 2018 in Vancouver, Washington, who got trapped inside of a uh, an escape room. Like he broke in with the intention of robbing the business, I guess not knowing that it was an escape room. And then he got he got trapped first of all, but then like really scared because I guess in these uh, uh, the, the themed rooms, like one of them was this like it was like called the killing floor or right. whatever. So he breaks in, gets trapped, and then all of a sudden he sees like this weird autopsy table and there's like saw blades everywhere and stuff like that. And he he had to call nine one one on his, himself. His, his criminal mind kicked in, so he was thinking the worst. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah. but yeah, he ended up having to call the police yeah. to get rescued. Yeah. So that's that probably up there with my favorites. Yeah. What made us want to cover more than just murder cases? So, Super simple answer. Yeah. Uh, if you're always doing the same thing, it, it gets boring. I mean, that's about as, as simple as it, as it doesn't get simpler than that. Right. How long does researching take for each video? Uh, way longer than you would think. <laughs> uh, the crimes of the week and international ones, it's a few hours usually just to find all the stories we're going to cover. I mean, sometimes people reach out to us and send us ideas. I'm always super grateful for that, but, uh, especially for the international one, I spend like a really long time looking through cause it's, it's not, obviously you can't just, there's no international database of crime right. stories every week. Right. Let alone so, silly ones when it, when it comes time for exactly, that. Exactly. So, yeah. Right. So, and it's a, it's about a balance of finding stuff. Uh, so it takes a while just to find those and then at least a full day's work uh, when it comes to writing each one of those scripts. And then for the long form stuff, the stuff that pushes like the 30, 40 minute range, I probably say like it's a solid day of just research alone, maybe two days, and then at least a solid day or more of writing. Right. And Nigel has a strong writing background too. So that's, you know, there's, there's, there's researching and then there's putting everything into your own words and that's sort of what, what takes a lot of the time. Yeah, for sure. Have families or people involved ever contacted you about stories to correct? Um, not so much about uh, to correct. Um, like, And to be honest, family members and stuff like that, we don't get a lot of... We, we get people in the comment section who... Uh, who have heard who, of or this was my, my neighbor somebody down the road. We get a lot more of that. People yeah. who are either say that they know the people or people who are connected to a story in, in some other way. Um, we have had people who say that they're family members or stuff like that. Um, generally well received, uh, you know, but it, it, the, the other thing too is it's it's always in the YouTube comment section. So it's, it's kind of hard to verify. Right. I've had a couple people hit me up uh, via email. Uh, so I've chatted with with some people, but it doesn't happen super often. We, Nigel and I do we we do both know somebody that used to work at our company that uh, has has ties to two of Canada's most notorious killers. That was that's pretty this insane. Is, this is facts. So I mean, we're gonna probably bring him on for an episode one time just to talk about his experience with a couple of pretty well known criminals in Canada. Yeah, that that's we definitely need to do that. Yeah. How do we choose the stories for Crimes of the Week International? Um, we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, uh, but basically I just have tons and tons of like go-to news sites uh, at this point, go-to news sites at this point. Sorry, I kind of mumbled that. Uh, but basically there's just a bunch of different sites that I've kind of built up over time. It 
Obviously, there's a bias towards uh, places that have English-speaking news sites, and so it's kind of luck of the draw with that. Uh, but basically, just over time doing this, I've kind of found like a whole bunch of different sites that are good generally for, for news. And I have probably, I don't know, 30, 40 different sites that I go to on a weekly basis to look for information. Right. The hardest places to pronounce. And this is funny because it's not, the, the question was posed for Crimes of the Week International, but um, there are some places in the States <laughs> and other English speaking countries like in, in, in England and uh, in Australia, we think that we know how to pronounce them properly. Oh yeah. And we'll always have locals telling us that we're wrong. But as people from Toronto, yeah. we're kind of used to that. I mean, yeah, exactly. a lot of people say Toronto, uh, we're close to a, a suburb of Toronto called Etobicoke that a lot of people say Etobicoke yep. so, or Etobicoke. <laughs> so it's oftentimes the hardest ones are the ones that we just assume because we speak the language that we're saying them properly. But uh, yeah, we're, we're wrong sometimes. Yeah, for sure. And I, I'll just say jokingly, uh, England, you need to you need to get your shit together because you guys all seem to disagree about <laughs> how your places are pronounced. I swear it's not just me. Part of it is me. I'm mm -hmm. sure I, I botch names all the time. But like I oftentimes will have three or four different people, all of whom tell me are from England, who themselves will disagree about the way a specific locality or town or village is pronounced. So I think there's something going on. Either that or you guys are all just, you know, well, it's having also, a laugh. And, and with respect to Australia, and we've got a lot of fans in Australia, um, you almost have to have an accent. You know what I mean? You yeah. almost have to speak with a proper Australian. I know there's more than one Australian accent, but if we just use our regular accents, it doesn't sound the same. And, you know, we apologize for that, but it is what it is. Unless you want me to actually do it in like a, a right. terrible stereotypical yeah. accent. Which we're not going to do that. I'm, I was going to say I'm not above doing that, but, <laughs> you know, we'll, yeah. we'll see what kind of right. response we get. Right. Um, but in terms of actual hard to pronounce like things, I think if I had to go off the top of my head, there's a there's a couple of like uh, like click names that have come up in the past, specifically in uh, South Africa. And I just just won't even attempt that because I'm going to butcher it it's so not, It's not a natural sound. So and yeah. generally in South For Africa, us. there's there's like a name that it was before that that's in English that I can say, so I'll just go with that, you know, just not to be, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, we, you know, we joke about this, but being in Canada, there's French Canadians that have trouble pronouncing TH. Yeah, true. It comes out as duh, so it's, you know, that it happens. But I would say that definitely some of the English, the English-speaking countries give us the, 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 we were corrected more often than not by people from other English speaking countries. Yeah. I think somebody also wanted to know if we spoke different languages too. Mm -hmm. We don't. I mean, I, I, we just, we both just speak English. Right. Although our, our video editor, Camillo, he speaks uh, Spanish fluently and then right. Portuguese. So he does help us with some of the pronunciation for, for, sure. them, for yeah. some of that stuff. So that really does come in handy. Yeah. So uh, before we wrap up here, uh, we told you that there would be a sort of other announcement best way to say it is we didn't do all of this stuff just to use it one time so yeah the we're going to be doing on camera stuff for all of the thursday videos going forward right so yeah I, we're, it's pretty exciting i'm really glad i'm really glad that we were able to do this again there's lots of questions to go over here lots of feedback that we're going to want from all, from all of the subs but we, we were trying to think of a way that we could actually be on camera um, while doing crimes of the week and crimes of the week international we still don't know if that's really possible or if it'll look the same but having said that, we're also open to not doing Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International anymore also. Uh, yeah. We'd like to hear your feedback. Do you like it? Do you want to hear other stories? We used to do top 10 lists. We used to do crimes of certain cities or states or countries. Um, a lot of it's just, you know, whatever is done well, we've kind of stuck with, but it's been a while now. So any suggestions are obviously uh, will obviously help us grow the channel. Just tell us what you want to see, basically. Right. We, ha we have some ideas of our own that we might try out and stuff like that. But we're basically, we you know, from here, the sky's the limit. Right. Um, so, yeah, just thanks, everyone, for watching. And uh, <laughs> there's not a whole we, lot else to say. Yeah, we appreciate the support, yeah, honestly. So much. And all the feedback that we get. And, you know, there's always going to be some negative comments. And that's fine, too. I mean, we can anything we can do to improve, let us know. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. Well, Take care.